morning, everybody. Um, welcome to another uh, action-packed hour of uh, the Good Natured Hour here from Good Natured World Headquarters. Um, before we, we get into the, uh, the meat of tonight's program, I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you who have been spreading the word. Uh, Bob and Kathy, I know you sent it out to the, uh, the Audubon membership, and uh, I know we've got uh, some new people joining us tonight from that and from some other uh, parts of our district as well. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, let's get going. I'll start the slide share with um, some uh, interesting notes from the field. <laughs> let's see here. Someday I'm going to figure out how to do this smoothly. Um, but in the meantime, you have to deal with me <laughs> and this. Here we go. Uh... So, um, Last week, or actually over the last few weeks, I know we've been uh, anxious for, for signs of spring, and we've touched on this uh, once or twice, that this is the time of year when we tap our trees to make syrup. Uh, last week, it was two weeks ago, and we talked about this, we mentioned it's not just the maple trees um, that you can tap from. You can get sap uh, and turn it into syrup from uh, birch trees. In fact, the birch sap, I think, is just starting uh, to get moving. Uh, the, the maples, on the other hand, um, are uh, actually the, the sap is not going to be good for too much longer. Uh, I know the silver maple that I tap, its buds are starting to open. And, and once that starts to happen, uh, the sap that you get out is going to uh, lack a lot of the sugar that, that makes for good syrup. So, um, but except we wanted to take a little bit of a closer look on just why it is that um, trees make sap and sap can be made into syrup. Um, what we tapped this year actually had its beginnings last year during uh, the growing season. Now, the leaves come out in the springtime. You might remember this from, uh, from biology class. The leaf's job on the tree is to make the food for the tree. Um, the way it's able to do that is a, a pigment uh, known as chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, uh, I'm gonna show this little animation here. Chlorophyll is able to take uh, the sun's energy um, and uh, use that to drive some chemical reactions. Those leaves in the carbon dioxide, a water comes up through the tree, uh, you add that, that heat, that solar energy from the sun, and you end up with what we see here, sugar, uh, glucose, carbohydrates, call it what you will. That is what helps the tree to grow. And that is actually the basis for um, the syrup that we have um, today. So uh, the leaves photosynthesize uh, throughout uh, late spring and summer, but then um, the seasons start to change. Uh, the chlorophyll uh, actually dissipates, leaves the leaves. And what we're left with then are some of the other pigments that are not actually able to perform photosynthesis, but they're still really pretty. Um, if there's anything more popular than uh, maple sugaring season, it might be the fall color season. Uh, those leaves uh, then leave the tree for good, but it's, it's important before that happens that that good sugar, that, that energy that was created throughout the spring and summer and early fall, that doesn't drop off the tree with the leaves. If it did, the tree wouldn't, it wouldn't do the tree any good, it wouldn't do us any good either. So um, that, uh, that glucose that's made goes back down through the branches into the trunk and uh, some of it is even stored a little bit down in the roots. But um, it's important that that sugar leaves the leaves before the leaves uh, leave the tree. The tree then enters a, a period of dormancy. Um, and then as we get into this, the, the late winter and um, 
early, early spring, as the, as the days start to get longer, as we start to see a bigger temperature gradient between nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures, um, the sap is going to start to run. The, the uh, roots are that have been um, underneath the ground, that, you know, the roots job is to bring up water. They're going to bring water up through the tree. Uh, it's gonna pick up that, uh, that sugar that was made last year. And it's going to start to send it up to the tips of the branches so that the buds, that the leaf buds that are waiting to open again, can have the energy that they need. Now that's, um, there's uh, some pressure changes that occur as, as the tree warms up in the daytime. Ideally, the, the best time to tap our trees is when the uh, nighttime temperatures are below freezing and the daytime temperatures are a little bit above. That creates some uh, pressure gradients within the tree and sap can actually start to flow um, up and down actually, as it turns out. Uh, there is movement both up and down in the tree as the sap starts to move. Um, and you think actually with all of that, that moving around that there'd be some sound that occurs. There actually supposedly is, I have to say we, some of us nature nerds, we went out and we tried this last week um, Dr. Sarah was good enough uh, to do loan us some uh, stethoscopes. Thank you again for that, Sarah Kimber. But um, we went and listened to some trees, but you'll notice uh, it was a cloudy day. It was kind of a cold day. Um, we didn't really hear much of anything other than traffic driving by and planes going overhead. But we are going to try this experiment again, and I'll be sure to report to you uh, if you can indeed hear uh, the liquids moving within uh, the uh, uh, inner bark uh, and the, uh, the xylem part of the tree. Uh, but anyway, um, I know I've got some proof here that the sap really was moving. This was in uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you'll notice from the bark, this is not a sugar maple. This is a, um, a silver maple. But uh, as I mentioned before, it's not just the sugar maples that have the uh, of um, rights to uh, making sugary sap. This was actually much sweeter than I thought it would be. Um, the problem with tapping maples other than sugar maples is that the sugar concentration in the sap, can you hear that dripping there? Uh, that sap um, uh, sugar concentration tends to be a little bit lower. There tends to be more water that needs to be boiled off. Uh, but I was really pleased with the uh, amount of sugar that was in the sap from this tree. Um, the, the standard, or the often cited, I should say, ratio of water to sugar is 40 to 1. So uh, to put that in, in plain terms, uh, it's about a bathtub full of sap to make one gallon of sugar maple syrup. Um, the amount of water and the, the amount of sap required goes up from there. I've heard silver maples was anywhere from uh, 50 to one to maybe even a little bit more than that. Uh, but it, uh, I was, again, I was really surprised at how sweet this sap tasted as it was coming out of the tree. Now, um, this part, frankly, isn't all that technical. You um, make the hole in the tree, uh, seven sixteenths of an inch is the old standard. Uh, there's now, um, Spiles, and by the way, spile is the name for the uh, the tap that you drive into the tree. And you, you might notice here, mine was actually uh, something I made. Uh, we talked about this uh, before. That's an elderberry branch uh, that I poked the pith out of the center. I made a, a, it was a little twig about maybe four inches long or so. Um, you can now buy what they call health taps or health spiles that are, have an even smaller diameter, and it lessens the impact on the tree. Uh, so anyway, I collected the sap. The, the real trick to making good syrup isn't so much in the collecting. Um, what you get in the bucket there, you, you strain, you get out any kind of particles that might have fallen in, uh, and you're left with what looks like water that tastes slightly sweet. The trick, though, comes in boiling it. Um, you want to keep the, the sap at a boil. Um, you want to get all the water off of it. Now, if you're boiling large quantities, um, there's horror stories of people losing their wallpaper because uh, they've boiled so much sap indoors. Uh, a lot of people, you know, tend to do it outside. Um, I didn't have that much from the silver maple. I think it was about six gallons. So 
um, it boiled, and that was over a, a period of a couple of days. So um, the, the boiling, the initial boiling off, you just wanna get the steam rolling and you wanna get that uh, sugar starting to concentrate. Um, as it starts to uh, get down to the uh, concentration that makes for a good tasting syrup, that's when you have to be really careful. Um, and I can tell you that uh, I lost my focus. I actually had a little bit of a boil over. Um, that is uh, the syrup boiling crew there with me. That's Joey, Boker, and Kit. They were all the more uh, willing to help when they found out they were going to be a part of it. Um, I had to wipe up. That's uh, a pot holder. You know, it's funny. People never borrow my Bliss text because they see how I use it to um, give size ratios for things like scat and owl pellets. People don't borrow my pot holders either. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I had a little bit of a boil over, but um, I did actually end up with some pretty decent tasting syrup. See, it's a little bit darker than I wanted to, to have it. Um, um, again, that was, was partially due to my inattentiveness as I was getting down towards that, um, that final syrup stage. If you have a candy thermometer, I know it's recommended that you boil um, some like candy thermometers will even have a syrup stage uh, listed because um, there's like the, the soft uh, ball and the hard ball stages when you're making candy. Uh, some of those will also list a, a syrup stage that I believe is around 219 degrees. Um, but uh, anyway, um, the syrup that we're tasting today that came from the trees that we collected the sap from within the last few weeks actually had its start last spring and summer. Um, and we're just about ready to enter our newest uh, SAP development. Form. So uh, that's a little bit of a look at the, uh, the science behind the syrup. Oh, next, um, this was a really interesting thing. And I, I think it's going on around here just as it is out in the Pacific Northwest. But I, let me give you a little background on it. Um, I had done a program a couple of weeks ago uh, on bald eagles for a group down in Aurora. And one of those people mentioned that there were some, uh, there was some interesting eagle activity uh, near the, um, the Route 30 bridge in Montgomery. Um, if you're familiar with that area, so this is, um, if we look at this, this uh, Google map image here on the uh, right there where it says River Road, that's uh, Route 25. And down there in the lower left, you can see that's the Route 30 bridge. Well, there's a couple of islands there. And there is a fairly large and I believe still growing heron rookery there. You can see it from the bridge. You, you can actually see it quite easily right now because the trees haven't leafed out yet. Well, the person in, in the uh, Eagle program a few weeks ago uh, mentioned that uh, there had been some, some eagles hanging out in the heron rookery, and they wondered if maybe they were going to start nesting there, if maybe they were going to take over uh, one of those large heron nests. You um, might recall if you've tuned in in past weeks, I think we've talked about how sometimes great horned owls will take over heron uh, nests. Well, in this case, um, the eagles were just kind of hanging out there. They were still fishing in that stretch of the river. This is actually kind of a productive stretch. Uh, just a little bit downstream from here um, is Violet Patch Park, which is another uh, great place for eagle watching. And then also along there is uh, the, uh, the outflow for the is it Fox Metro. It's one of the treatment plants that's uh, along the Fox River. Whenever you have a treatment plant, you're always going to have uh, the, the water that comes out is, is held to some very high standards, but you are always going to have a little bit of bump in the nutrients that are entering the river. Um, and that was going to help uh, more plants grow. That's going to help more uh, the phytoplankton, uh, the plant plankton and the zooplankton, the animal plankton to grow, which is going to feed uh, the food chain. So um, that always bodes well then for the, uh, the animals that live there. So didn't really think much at first about eagles hanging out there. And then um, somebody mentioned, well, you know, there's also, um, there's an eagle nest up here um, by, uh, so, sorry, I've, I've, I've driven up <laughs> north quite a bit from Montgomery. This image shows you um, 
Uh, this is again Route 25 here uh, on the left, and then there's a, kind of an office industrial park type area, and then there's this large swath of green here. That's actually a state uh, natural area called Heron Woods, and it's, it's home to a lot of great blue herons. Well, there's an eagle nest there too. Well, the person who had first mentioned the eagles in um, down in Montgomery then um, proceeded to tell me, uh, send me this article and say, check this out. This is a, an article that ran in January uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, the title was The Bird That Builds Nests Right by Its Worst Enemy. And it uh, talked about uh, Pacific Northwest herons that actually uh, were locating their rookeries, which is their large nest colonies, uh, right near bald eagle nests. And eagles eat herons. So the scientists that were studying this phenomenon were, were at first thinking, well, my goodness, the, the herons, we, we finally we've brought bald eagles back from near extinction. They're now uh, delisted. They are no longer considered an endangered species. They're still certainly protected, but uh, their populations are coming back uh, quite strongly uh, thanks to the cleaning up of our rivers and uh, having healthier fish populations. Well, um, the, the herons too have benefited from those, those healthy fish, but the, the fear, um, the, the subspecies that's out in the Pacific Northwest um, is a, a little bit more un, unusual and, and rare. And the fear was, well, if the eagles move in, they're gonna eat all the herons and that's gonna be the end of that. Well, as it turned out, uh, the rookeries that uh, were constructed near eagle nests um, actually had higher survival rates than um, heron rookeries that didn't have eagles. And what they are looking at is what they're calling a predator protection hypothesis. And it's honestly, it's not that much uh, different from uh, the old, you know, you, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, I'll take good care of you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, where these uh, herons are realizing that um, accepting the presence of the eagles or even welcoming the presence of the eagles is going to bring them protection from a lot of other predators. Uh, a great horned owl isn't going to swoop into an eagle, uh, a heron nest if there's an eagle nearby. Uh, osprey are going to avoid uh, predating, although osprey, you know, they mostly eat fish. That's a bad example. But, you know, um, other nest raiders are going to steer clear once they see the presence of an eagle. So I'm kind of wondering if we're starting to see a similar phenomenon in this area. I, I don't have any, any proof of that other than uh, there's herons in Montgomery and now there's eagles in Montgomery hanging out by the heron nests. And uh, there's the heron nests up in uh, Bartlett and they now have an eagle by them as well. It almost seems like around here, the eagles have moved in next to the herons, whereas out in the Pacific Northwest, the herons moved in next to the eagles. But it's it's certainly some food for thought. Um, and it's actually not the, the first time uh, I've seen a relationship with bald eagles and herons. Now, this is a shot from down at, uh, it's like this, uh, prior to the resurgence of the uh, the bald eagle population along the Fox River, um, this was the place to go see eagles, and it still is. Uh, there's a, a, a Black and Dam uh, right there at Starved Rock on the Illinois River, and um, eagles would congregate there in the winter time because of the open water. Well, I remember looking at the eagles and um, you know watching them sitting there in the trees, and then. Um, I looked down and beneath where the eagles were, there was a whole bunch of herons. So, um, and these, these birds had opted to, to not migrate, which actually herons oftentimes, if they can find enough food, they're gonna stick around. Um, migrating uh, for a heron, if they can you know, find enough fish to eat, uh, they'll even sometimes switch their diet over to, to mammals that they find, voles and such. Um, but here, these guys thought, you know, why should we leave when there's hunks of fish raining down on us? Which, uh, so they're, they were kind of eating the eagle leftovers. Um, there were a few other birds down there too. There's a couple of egrets um, as well that were taking advantage of that, that bounty, which was basically the, the scraps or the leftovers that the eagles left behind. So um, 
just just a little food for thought for you that eagles and herons there might be more to their relationship let's let's keep an eye on the the eagle nests around here and the heron rookeries that we know about and we'll see see how um, if we can find any uh, predator um, protection hypotheses of our own right here in the fox valley now next um you might have heard over the last few weeks, uh, the sandhill cranes have been migrating overhead. Uh, a lot of them are heading farther north up into Wisconsin and Michigan and, and southern Canada. But uh, just like the eagles, the, the sandhill crane population um, in the last, say, 20 years or so has, has really started to grow here in northern Illinois. Uh, and that's a, a breeding population. Um, these birds were also once considered endangered and now uh, they too have been uh, delisted here uh, in Illinois. Um, now I got to give some credit to uh, Kay Hensel for this video. This Kay, as I recall, this was at uh, over by Peck Farm and we see, oops, I knew I was going to screw something up here. Let's try it again. There we go. Um, so Kay happened to witness some behavior. Keep your eye on the bird on the left. Um, not just what, what, what's he doing here? He's got something else on his mind besides just foraging. Um, that's the, uh, the start of, uh, one of their, um, uh, enchanting little rituals that they have. The cranes are famous for their courtship dances. Um, we'll probably start to see more of that activity as the, uh, the mating season uh, takes place, but this is most likely not part of a, a migratory flock, but this, this is probably a pair um, in its home territory, kind of uh, having a little bit of nesting on its mind, their minds. Now, unlike, I know a lot of times you look at a, at a crane and you look at a heron and you think, wow, those birds are awfully similar. They're, they're actually quite different. Uh, they're, they're, size wise, they're about the same, but uh, whereas herons nest in large colonies up in trees, um, uh, cranes nest down on the ground. They usually have two eggs and those eggs produce little, um, little baby cranes called colts. Um, these birds, uh, within about eight hours of hatching, they're up and moving around uh, following mom and dad. And those parents then become quite protective. In fact, that gives me a little, little bit of cause for concern as we start to see our, our crane population growing. Um, they, uh, they are nesting closer and closer to humans. Uh, and there are some interactions that sometimes aren't uh, quite as um, happy, I guess, <laughs> as we'd like to see. Um, we've had some people here at the park district. Uh, one fellow lost some uh, chrome trim on his car because the heron didn't, or sorry, the crane didn't like it. Uh, we had a woman who's uh, lost a, a window next to her door because the crane was, um, fighting with its reflection. So these are very large, very powerful birds. I always recommend you keep your distance because especially when those youngsters come, they are going to be very protective. Um, but with that said, look at this. Um, they have uh, rebounded from uh, an estimated 25 breeding pairs in the eastern population. Now, this is a map. We, we have several different um, populations of sandhill cranes in North America. And this is a kind of a color-coded map. The, the birds that we're seeing here are that kind of peachy uh, um, uh, orangish color there on the right, the Eastern population. You can see where they uh, overwinter. Um, although we, we have had reports of birds that are staying here now. I, I think I showed you that picture. If I didn't, I meant to from a couple of weeks ago, there were three um, sandhill cranes in with uh, some geese along the Fox River in Batavia, um, far in advance of the, the migrating flocks that we're seeing now. Uh, but they, they don't go terribly far, um, anywhere from, uh, say, Kentucky, a little bit into southern Indiana. Some will, will go down into Florida. Um, but uh, this part of the range here, this top part, the breeding range, is continuing to spread out um, even into some of our uh, New England states. So they are doing very, very well. Uh, the, some of the hunting seasons have been reinstated. Um, and uh, it's just uh, another one of the great conservation success stories. Uh, made me think of 
of Aldo Leopold in Marshland Elegy. He called them wilderness incarnate. Um, he said the quality of cranes lies, I think, in this higher gamut as yet beyond the reach of words. When we hear his call, we hear no mere bird. We hear the trumpet in the orchestra of evolution. He is a symbol of our untamable past and of that incredible sweep of millennia which underlies and conditions the daily affairs of birds and men. Keep, keep your ears open, they are continuing to move through and uh, they are indeed um, wilderness incarnate and just one magnificent animal. Now, um, Laura McKenzie, I have to thank you for this next story. Uh, Laura was over at uh, Del Nor Woods scoping out the beaver activity. This is actually some footage I took. Um, uh, let's see, this would be uh, last, it was uh, the day after Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> uh, so May the 6th of 2020. Um, I was out there scoping out uh, the activity at Del Nor Woods. Those of you who don't live in St. Charles, Del Nor Woods is a wonderful community park that we have here in St. Charles. It has a um, basically a drainage uh, that runs through it. Um, there's several man-made dams along that drainage, I think three dams. And then uh, there's this new dam that popped up. Uh, the beavers kind of, um, they didn't get evicted, but they got kind of, uh, uh, they they didn't like what we did. Our we had our our parks crews uh, had to do some uh, maintenance on a, a bridge farther up in the drainage uh, of this creek, and that bridge happened to be where uh, a family of beavers had constructed a dam, which caused the uh, water levels to rise up in that area. Uh, it was high enough for them to actually build a pretty impressive lodge. Well, when that bridge came out. Um, and the beavers had no choice but to leave because the water levels dropped and they could no longer enter their lodge from underwater, which is what they prefer to do. The lodge entrance was exposed. So they packed up and they moved downstream and they are now located um, just to the south of um, the park's main entrance on Route 25. So this was what the dam looked like last spring. Now, Laura, you were there. Um, just uh, last week, and this thing has continued to grow. Um, beavers uh, are adding layers of mud and layers of sticks. I suspect a lot of those sticks were what they fed on over the winter time. Uh, beavers don't uh, hibernate, but they'll form what we call a, a cache of food. So they they fed on those sticks and uh, added them to their dam. It's going to be very interesting as we get into. Um, spring uh, of this year, and we're probably going to be getting some more rains. I want to see just how far this water is going to back up. Um, where they were before, we, whenever you have beavers present in a suburban environment, you always have to worry about um, their effect on the humans that live nearby. And the humans that live nearby and their, um, how they're going to feel about those effects. Um, I know sometimes beavers have to be trapped out and, and relocating beavers really isn't an option. They don't uh, adapt well. Um, there's usually, they're, they're territorial animals. So when you move beavers into an, a different area, there's going to be beavers uh, there that object to that. And there'll be fights and usually the new guys uh, end up losing. It's kind of an ugly sort of situation. So um, whenever we do have to remove beavers from one of our parks, it's, it's a, a lethal trapping sort of situation. So I'm hoping that in this can, uh, certain area, uh, they've got a lot of space here for the water to spread out. And what we're starting to see is, is the, uh, the change of the habitat here. It's gonna, uh, as this water spreads out, it's gonna go from being a flowing body of water to a still body of water. That's going to create changes in the types of plants that grow there. Um, and that in turn will change the, uh, the types of animals that we see around it. Now, um, there are some houses not too far from here, but there's a very steep embankment. And I don't think the water would ever get so high as to encroach on their property. So um, it's an interesting, uh, almost like a little beaver lab that's going on here at Del Nor Woods. And it's certainly uh, again, something to keep an eye on as we go through uh, our seasons. The, the beavers are probably uh, in the, uh, the 
midst of their um, breeding season too. We should, they should be having their young soon if they haven't already. Um, those young will stay with their parents uh, for uh, at least a year, sometimes longer. And then the offspring, as they move on, sometimes they just end up moving right next door to mom and dad. So we'll keep an eye on this and uh, see what happens to this Delnor Woods beaver population. So, Laura, you, were, uh, you also sent uh, this photo. Um, so yeah, we call this restoration. And to be perfectly honest, um, Restoration is it's a very young science. Uh, it's also a classic example of sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Uh, Delnor Woods has undergone, um, it's, it's undergone restoration in, in some fits and starts. Uh, the, what I consider the front part of the park, um, the woods that are closer to the, the pond and Route 25, the front pond and Route 25, um, those were, were managed um, and restored uh, probably close to 20 years ago when the, the park was acquired um, by the St. Charles Park District. And um, in that front area, we see a lot of woodland wildflowers. We see um, bloodroot and uh, uh, the uh, prairie trillium, the trillium recurvatum, the, the red, the, we call them the bloody nose trillium, you know, the little red trillium. Um, and there's uh, Virginia water leaf there. Um, as we get further on into the growing season, we see a lot of Joe pie weed there. Well, that's because early on, a lot of uh, buckthorn, uh, invasive buckthorn and honeysuckle were removed. The uh, back part of the park um, didn't have that sort of restoration applied to it until very recently. So I, I'll admit right now it looks kind of bad, but um, it's all this stuff here is what we're trying to thin out. Um, I mentioned uh, buckthorn. We've got, a, especially in the eastern part of the park, there's an awful lot of European buckthorn in there. It's, it's growing. Uh, the problem there is that it, it grows so thickly that it, it shades out other plants. It also changes the soil's chemistry so that other plants really can't grow there. It, it almost uh, creates a monoculture for itself. There's even some research showing that it, um, the changes to the soil that it makes actually make for better habitat for um, earthworms. And I know you might be thinking, oh, well, worms are good. A lot of our uh, local earthworms are actually imported as well. Uh, we've got several European species uh, that grow right, uh, flourish actually right along with the buckthorn. Um, the problem with, with earthworms in a woodland setting is that they, they're a little too good at what they do. They, they decompose the leaf litter at a rate that's faster than our native uh, tree species are um, used to. They didn't co-evolve together. And so that leaf litter disappears more quickly. The, the microorganisms that are necessary for this particular part of the, uh, the ecosystem um, can't cope with the heavy duty activity of earthworms. But anyway, if we get uh, rid of that buckthorn, um, things are going to start to look up. Um, here's an example from that front uh, part of Delnor Woods. This is a Michigan lily. Some of you might call it the Turk's cap lily. Uh, you can see we've got some Joe pie coming up over here. Um, that just getting rid of the, the non-native species then uh, allows our native species to flourish. And sometimes we have to go in there with seed afterwards. Sometimes it's just a matter of opening the woods up and allowing the sunlight in and the seed bed is just there waiting. So uh, that's what's going on. Uh, you know, a couple of you had expressed concern about that, all the cutting at Delmer Woods, but it is with this goal in mind. Um, think if you've been out to Hickory Knolls lately, you see there's a lot of blackened ground out there. In addition to cutting down invasive species, um, our restoration ecologists are also lighting a lot of things on fire right now. Uh, that's to, uh, does a couple of different things. It helps control uh, woody species that would otherwise invade, uh, say, a, a prairie uh, sort of uh, setting. Um, it, it also helps return uh, nutrients to the soil quickly. It controls non-native um, plants that we don't want growing in our um, prairie areas. Um, so there, um, 
there is quite a bit of black ground right now. I would say in the next couple of weeks, you might see some more smoke columns come up as um, Fermilab and the King County Forest Preserve, all the forest preserve districts around here have to kind of hustle uh, to get their burning done before uh, the spring birds are arriving and starting to nest. We've got some ground nesting species, in fact, that are coming back already. So um, a dry day where the ground is also not snow covered or otherwise wet um, in late winter, that's the peak season for these burns. So it kind of helps explain a little bit of uh, what you've been seeing maybe as you've been driving around. Um, it should though, it will be ending very soon now as we get, uh, get into springtime. Okay, so this, this next little piece, this is a, a throwback. Um, last summer, at Good Natured Hour, we um, took a peek inside. This is a, a bird feeder I have in my backyard, and, and I haven't put bird seed in it for years. Um, I was clearing some brush in my own backyard, and I happened to bump against the post that held this bird feeder, and the feeder buzzed back at me. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And I, I was afraid I was gonna get attacked by uh, some paper wasps who weren't happy that I was too close to their home. But when I, when I lifted the lid, what I found was a bumblebee nest. I was really excited. It was uh, Eastern bumblebees, uh, bombus and patients that were living in there. Um, they had taken over an old mouse nest. Um, that's a relationship that we oftentimes will see where bumblebees uh, will move into, um, Amount, I don't know what it is about a rodent nest that they find appealing, but they'll sometimes they'll use an old chipmunk burrow for a, a nest. Um, uh, I know one time I had a friend who had bumblebees living in a mouse nest in her uh, in their gardening shack. They had a paper sack that a mouse had built a nest in. Well, the mouse moved out and the bumblebees moved in. So there there's is a relationship between uh, mice and um, and rodents. Well, anyway. Um, when I checked this nest again in the fall, the bees were gone and uh, the mouse was back. Well, this winter, I, I got curious. I wasn't sure because we've had some really cold days and I wasn't sure um, if the mouse had survived. And sure enough, I don't know if you can see here, there he or she is um, poking its little nose out, probably wishing that this noisy, you know, human neighbor would just keep her hands to herself. But um, this uh, this is actually uh, this is maybe the third time uh, that I opened the lid. I, I kind of botched the video the first couple of times, but the mouse um, held steady and um, didn't really come out in poves, but also didn't run away and hide either. Um, this is what what the mouse did last uh, last year when I went to check on it. It is a white-footed mouse, so it's a native um, species. Um, we can tell that it's a native mouse and not a European house mouse by this uh, light coloring here underneath. Uh, it's got, um, oh, they're called white-footed mice. It's not totally white under on the feet, but uh, there is white underneath. Um, and then the overall coloring of the, um, the mouse is a brownish color. They're actually kind of cute. Um, so anyway, um, birdhouse mouse is still hanging in there. Um, now, um, next week, uh, we've got a whole bunch of uh, updates to bring to you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about song sparrows. Uh, I'm going to report to you on the salamander monitoring that's going on in the Hickory Knolls natural area. Um, they're forecasting 60s um, for this uh, weekend and, and the beginning of next week. So that's going to signal the reemergence of snakes. And there's a couple species I wanted to introduce you to there. Uh, got some fun reader emails. You never know what else is going to happen. Um, but before we open it up for questions, I did want to segue into one more thing. Um, I was um, digging around in my freezer at home the other day and um, I, was <laughs> I was actually looking for a package of hamburger and um, something else rolled out. So I wanted to show you what it was. I think you'd appreciate it. So I'm going to stop the share and here it is. Um, there's a baggie and at first I thought what in the world 
this, I, I, sometimes I lose track of things that are in the freezer, but I um, opened it up. And, oh, this, this is so cool. This is actually my spirit bird. Um, and it, unfortunately, this particular individual um, met its end uh, right here on the, the window of Good Natured World Headquarters, um, found it laying on the porch. Um, this is a cedar waxwing. I don't know if you've ever gotten to see one of these birds close up, but they are just truly awe-inspiring. Um, you can see it's, it's not a huge bird. Um, sometimes people see them and they think it's some kind of a cardinal because they do have the ability to um, pull up the feathers on their head. It forms a, a kind of a crest. Um, the reason I call them my spirit bird is they've been described as um, voracious and gluttonous, um, prone to excess. All the things that happen to me around the holidays, um, they, they will gorge themselves on berries, sometimes to the point of not being able to fly. Uh, sometimes if those berries are fermented, they'll um, get a little drunk and they can't fly either. Um, now this bird, I don't know that it, it hit the window. Um, this was in the fall. So it, it might have been uh, during a, a period of of migration, but what I what I wanted to show you, well, was first of all a couple of things. Um, they will have uh, this yellow tip to the tail. Uh, they'll also have kind of a black mask here at the front, and then they have just the coolest thing. That's what gives them their name of waxwing. These birds produce a kind of a waxy secretion at the tip of their wings. You see that, that red? That's not feather. That's um, oh, a waxy secretion. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what it's made out of. And there's, there's some debate as to what that um, secretion is there for. The, the most convincing uh, explanation I read was that um, the young birds don't have that, by the way. Um, and then as the bird ages, that waxy secretion forms, it kind of gets bigger as um, the bird gets older. So there's some thinking that perhaps um, that's a signal for uh, breeding uh, birds when if they, they might wanna select for a mate that has a greater amount of waxy secretion on its wings, or maybe I should say maybe an optimal amount. I suppose if there's too much, the bird might be deemed older or too old, uh, it might be deemed a, a good survivor and, and have good genes. I don't, I don't know what goes on in the mind of a cedar waxwing. But um, anyway, that's, that's what gives the bird um, their name, waxwing, is that red on the wings. Pretty cool, huh? All right, I had one other thing. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, so I was sitting at my desk the other day and I heard a sound and I was the only one here. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really a human sound anyway. And I, I looked over to this little vial and I thought, you know what? The sound is coming from inside. Um, this, and I'm, I'm kind of glad actually that the sound has stopped. This vial actually contained um, a whole lot of gypsy moth egg cases. Um, I wanted to show these to you in case you have um, a bur oak tree or um, a hardwood, I should say any kind of hardwood actually these guys can be found on. But you know, out here in front of our offices, we have this magnificent oak tree. Um, it's probably uh, well over 100 years old. Um, and every year it gets a few gypsy moths on it. Um, the gypsy moth female does not fly. She's a white moth and she'll sit on the side of the tree. Sometimes you don't even notice she's there, especially if the sun is shining. Um, she sits still. It's the males that fly. And the males are um, kind of a medium size. That's, I'm holding my fingers up. That's about a little over an inch in size. They're a dusky brown color. 
what usually catches my eye is um, not the white females on the dark bark, but the presence of these um, brown males fluttering around. Um, they have a pretty erratic flight pattern. I think they're probably using their antennae to sense the pheromones of the females, but the, the males will be uh, kind of eye-catching. Well, they mate, and then the female will produce um, this fluffy brown egg case. Um, and uh, we used to have a custodian that would remove these. Uh, we have a new custodian now. I, I think he's still learning the ropes. I'll have to teach him about gypsy moths as we get into uh, the season again this year. Now, they're, they've been on this tree every year for uh, as long as I can remember. I've worked at the park district now for 14 years, almost 14 years. Um, and they, they've never defoliated the tree. Um, the, the tree has always survived. Um, the tree, though, is somewhat stressed. It's surrounded by a uh, house and sidewalks and driveways and streets. Um, so I do try to remove as many of these as I can. But what had happened was I, I can't throw anything away. So I put them in this vial and the, um, the uh, eggs actually hatched and these little um, gypsy moth caterpillars, can you see that? No, it's kind of hard to see. Um, Here's a big clip. They were um, just, you know, crawling around and uh, crawling on each other, I guess, and, and scraping against the, uh, the side um, of their cocoon. But anyway, um, the good news is they are no longer, um, and I think we saved, um, I would, gosh, I would guess that there's a few hundred of those egg cases here. I'm sorry, a few hundred of uh, a few hundred eggs that were in these cases that are, well, gosh, now all over my desk. But anyway, uh, if you happen to um, have a hardwood tree, uh, if you've noticed gypsy moths on it in the past, now is a great time to check them because the eggs, if they weren't, um, you know, indoors here, these would not have hatched yet. Um, you can take a, a, a knife and scrape it off. Um, I scraped um, these egg cases. This up into um, a container. Um, you can put them in a bucket of soapy water uh, that'll that'll neutralize and, and kill them. Um, but it was just something that, thought, well, that's a kind of a timely reminder as we're getting into spring. If uh, they're not attended to, they will hatch and all these hundreds of caterpillars will be up on the trees eating the leaves. So uh, anyway, that kind of wraps up what I had for you this evening. Um, I know we've usually got uh, questions and comments. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share with the group that they've uh, seen as they've been out and about this past week? Oh, hey, Diane. Hi. Um, I was just wondering about the gypsy moths. Um, yeah. Egg cases. Are they just attached to the surface of the the trunk or are they in you know uh, over buds bud scars or you know where you are know what, they they tend so if this is say this is uh the grooves of the bark of the tree they're mm -hmm. they're usually um in between um in the grooves. bark okay so okay. yeah they're not they they wouldn't be they don't like hang like a cocoon or anything they're usually tucked in let me see if i can kind of replicate one and they're they're pretty good size like uh, I can hold this um they're you know over an inch uh, okay. and they they look um almost like uh, uh like I don't know insulation or you know, they're fluffy boy yeah, I think I've seen them before but um I was just wondering I mean do they stay pretty much on the trunk or are they all over the tree? On, they can be on the branches too. There were a few that I wasn't able to reach. Um, I'm thinking about getting a, a ladder. Um, I know I was doing a school program over at um, uh, Haynes Middle School before Haynes Middle School closed and um, noticed that there were some on that tree as well. Um, so I think they're around. Um, they haven't maybe grown to the point where they're um, a problem yet, but um, I do advocate for their removal. Now, if you if you wait or maybe you miss, you don't realize you have them. 
the gypsy moth caterpillar is, is pretty unique. It's, it's uh, furry and it has um, a series of red dots and a series of blue dots on its back. So there's no other caterpillar that looks like that. Out here. If you're familiar with Eastern tent caterpillars, mm -hmm. they have eyes and about that level of hairiness, <laughs> but um, it's those uh, red dots and blue dots that uh, differentiate them. And, and yeah, there's nothing else like them around. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else? No? All right, well, you know what? Um, I'll share uh, one more thing. I was doing some cleaning um, <laughs> you never know, you know, what's going to come across the, uh, hey, but I'm going to see if I can open this up. Um, when I was, um, heading out to take some video for next week's program, I, um, found some fox scat near some, uh, coyote scat, and I took some pictures of it. And then I found this, um, fox are very active right now. They are actually going to be having their pups, uh, kits now very shortly. Um, this is a textbook fox scat. So when you're out and about, um, there's a lot of signs on our trails right now of both coyotes and scat, um, coyote and fox scat. I'm gonna hold this up like this. Can you see the size of this? Um, it's got a wonderful little, and this was a true fox scat artist and I'll hold the white scat. Um, the scat is always twisted and then there'll be a little curly cue. You guys who know me know I call that the Dairy Queen swirl, but um, there's been a lot of, uh, of activity on our trails these days. Um, look around your neighborhoods. Uh, fox scat, we call it the rule of thumb. If you, if your thumb if the scat is as large as your thumb or larger, it's a pretty good chance it was a coyote. Um, if it's smaller than your thumb, as this is, you know you're looking at a fox. Hmm. St. Charles is the pride of the fox. So um, I think I will leave you with that thought for tonight and uh, hope that you'll join us again next week. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, I'll be here a few more minutes. I'll be glad to answer those for you. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, folks. Uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Thanks Pam. That was great. All right. Well, Thanks, Pam. Yeah, Thanks, Pam. That was really good. Thanks, Bye. Pam. Thanks, Bye. Pam. Wave. Wave. Thanks, Pam. Steve and I really enjoyed hearing oh, you. Oh, hey, Mary. Yes, we did. It was so oh, it was really great. Enjoyed it. <laughs> Hope we see you again sometime. Sure, for sure. sure. Have a good night. Bye-bye.